here with us, uh, and give us a talk about uh, contemporary Iranian art, and also sign her most recent book, which we have available at the center, and you can get it signed from her uh, at the reception afterwards. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Professor Talin Grigor, who uh, received her PhD from MIT, and um, researches on the cross-pollination of visual culture and global politics and post historiography, many focused on Iran and somewhat India. Her books include Building Iran, Modernism, Architecture, and National Heritage Under the Pahlavi Monarchs. It is an amazing book. If you have not read it, I suggest that you do get it. Uh, also, uh, the book that you're seeing and today you'll have a chance to purchase, Contemporary Iranian Art, From the Street Art to the Studio. And also, Persian Kingship and Architecture, Strategies of Power in Iran from the Achaemenids to the Pahlavis, uh, co-edited with uh, Susanna Babai. Uh, in terms of her um, Scholastic work beside books. She also has written a number of articles which have appeared in such places as The Art Bulletin, Getty Journal, Third Text, Future and Terrier, and Iranian Studies, among others. And I think she has received almost every kind of grant that is possible and fellowships um, when it comes to art history. And she's been a fellow at the National Gallery of Art. She's been a postdoctoral fellow at the Getty Research Institute. Uh, she has received a Social Science Research Council Fellow uh, Award. She was a Mellon Fellow at the uh, Cornell University. She was an Abba Khan student at MIT, uh, where she studied, uh, and many more, including Roshan and Sudawar Foundation scholarships or fellowships. Uh, her current book project considers the global impact of Europeans, Europe's art historiography vis-a-vis -vis practices of eclecticism and kitsch, but today of course she's going to be talking about contemporary Iranian art, and as someone who is somewhat of native, correct, um, of uh, this area, she has interviewed some of the local artists and we know some of them ourselves in Glendale and LA area who are in love with her work. I should say that this uh, talk was made possible due to the Tahang Foundation. This is one of the many programs that actually we have worked together and we're very glad that they are coming more and more in Orange County in Southern California and we hope to do much more with them so I thank at the Frahang Foundation for their support and making this talk possible. Please, Professor Gruber. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Professor Daryai, um, uh, for inviting me back. Uh, it's always a pleasure to reconnect with the community and the academic um, community as well as the Iranian community and I am deeply grateful to the Panhang Foundation um, for this invitation. Um, Thank <laughs> you. 
suburban Boston, an evening in May. I had been finishing a manuscript on contemporary Iranian art. My girls were in bed. In my pajamas, I was checking Facebook and reading my grandmother's eulogy. At 8.46 p.m., my cell phone rang. Number withheld. I immediately reached and answered. A woman's rather gentle voice, which I immediately recognized, despite the fact that I've never spoken to her, asked for me. I said as I stood up, oh my god, this is an honor. Mm -hmm. She asked, how did you recognize my name? I had no answer. I simply did not know the answer to that question. Iran's former empress's phone call rattled me. She had called to thank me for a, a copy of my first book. Undiplomatically, I jumped ahead of myself to tell her that she was not going to like it. That night, I could not sleep. And for months, I deeply regretted having told her my truth, that the book was a critical art history of her dynasty. Only much later did I realize two things. One, that I too, like the artist about whom I had been written, I'm in exile. Two, that my feeling of regret speaks to the impossibilities of a global art history because the workings of that art has long been tied to its politics of personality and patronage. Why did I recognize that voice? Why did I not know why? From its conception, the Empress was the main patron, the most enthusiastic audience, and an influential critique of a body of work that we call contemporary Iranian art today. For those reasons, its history has always been um, truncated, almost tribal. We are nowhere near to seeing a full picture. Historical distance is perhaps needed as our institutional structures and independent criticism to begin to create, at the very least, a coherent art history of it. The contemporary global art scene is young, dynamic, and multifaceted. A complex and highly sophisticated social network, rather than the usual texts and artifacts govern the development of its narratives and aesthetic judgment. In it, the letterhead of institutions seem to carry no weight in penetrating and amassing data in ways that the word of a friend of a friend might. A critical analysis of this art seems to be possible only through the awareness that one was barred from the friend of someone's friend, and therefore excluded from a part of the network that remains vital to that story. The ease with which I found myself in the studios of legendary artists, for instance, Pavis Panaboli, even while I could not convince aspiring ones to answer emails or the fact that recognized artists were eager to talk one moment and the next simply vanish, speaks directly to the network's operational logic. Anthropological approaches, cultural studies, social history, and critical theory are drawn as much as art history in telling the story. More often than not, I was unsuccessful in collecting data. Some artists chose not to be illustrated some critics could not be cited, and some galleries were not, no longer open. <laughs> art history can perhaps speak more effectively about the society when artists do not wish to be illustrated, when curators cannot be cited, and when galleries are closed. My analysis of the role of contemporary Iranian art, its production, its institutions and its politics is squarely based on the methodological impossibilities of this network. Fragmented but, but tightly linked, endlessly becoming yet never complete, marketable yet ethical, neither here or there, mobile but ancient. Sinless severed bodies and the fragile hearts back to Xerxes' feet. Zack Snyder's 2007 blockbuster 300 caused a lot of commotion. Many from the highest office of the Islamic Republic to ordinary Iranians in New Jersey and Westwood were appalled by the depiction of Persians with the aesthetics of the diseased and the disfigured, the barbarian personified. 
when asked, Emperor Farah assured our journalists that, quote, our rich and ancient culture cannot be belittled by one film or by the attitude of the current government, unquote. That at the time Western troops had invaded Iraq, an ancient Iranian land rendered this artistic depiction a thing of the contemporary. To negate myopic stereotyping of one's identity as depicted in 300 and to set the record straight, at, at times myopically, is a task undertaken by many contemporary artists who straddle languages, cultures, and lands. Others grapple with contemporaneity through a painstaking search for an artistic language that conveys the universality of art, violence, pain, capital, and displacement. Still for many to be auctioned at Christie's and Sotheby's is an evidence of the recognition in international forums, a seeming counter narrative to one, for instance, 300. For those who take pride in auction sales, contemporary art plays a central role in bearing witness to the fallacy of the hostile portrayal of other culture. An auction sale seems to include the global in its lucrative economy as valued and valuable, and above all, in its politics of visuality and visibility. I am civilized, sold. In order to get a sense of what contemporary Iranian art is and what it does today, we ought to examine the ways in which the diverse makers, buyers, and consumers of contemporary art from Tehran to New York and beyond defy art history's myths about originality, beauty, and singular stable identities. Contemporary art as such could perhaps be grasped with the deployment of multiple perspectives all but fragmented, but inclusive of the world that it depicts. This um, evening, through the three categories of historicity, marketability, and mobility, let's reconsider the def definitions of contemporary and Iranian art in the global context. Northern Tehran, circa spring 1966. Money, avant-gardism. Dynamic young artists. Empress Farah promoted them by seeing them their work at the Cité Café, a gathering place of artists, performers, and occasionally magicians and circus artists. It was in this atmosphere that Farah herself, a trained architect, began talks about building a permanent space for contemporary art in Iran. The first and 30 years on, still the best collection of Western modern and contemporary art outside the West was conceived. Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art was a rare phenomenon. Farah appointed his cousin, Kamran Diba, to serve as the architect and director of Timoka. He had an unlimited budget and a tight reign over the purchases of the collections. Within a few years, Diba acquired $2.5 billion worth of works by famous artists including Picasso, Braque, Pollack, Liechtenstein, Magritte, Miro, Duchamp, and of course, Andy Warhol, who painted the royal couple in Tehran in the late 1970s. Overnight, Timoka became the heart of Pahlavi avant-garde culture. From its well-chosen site to its vernacular modernist building, from its breathtaking collection to its diverse facilities, public programs, and academic uh, curricula. It housed all the activities that had been traditionally linked with a major cultural institution, over and above the latest trends in art practices and pedagogy. Permanent and temporary exhibitions, biennales for all medias, the screening of films, performances, academic lectures and workshops, casual cocktail parties, and official gatherings. It was ranked among the top 10 museums worldwide that had been expressly erected to house contemporary art. On the opening night, on October 14, 1977, there was nothing like it outside the West. Farah 
Despite success in ass uh, amassing the richest collection of contemporary art at Timoka, and in creating, creating an active, albeit small, and controlled artistic milieu, was aided by the unique environment of the 1970s Iran. Her artistic clairvoyance and patronage were sustained by the centralized and autocratic political system that was in place. Those in power did not hesitate to follow the lead of the royal court in order to project an image of contemporary taste. Neither the court nor the elite was short on cash in light of the oil boom of the 1970s. Western and non-Western art benefited greatly from both Farah's support of the arts and the synergy between them. The global was born here. Conceived each year from 1967 to 77, the Shiraz Art Festivals helped open up a global space for artistic exchange. All sorts of artists gathered in Shiraz and Persepolis from all over the world. The festivals, however, also revealed the gaps and tensions in the polit political status quo and the hegemony of the West. Many of the performances, for instance, the play Pig, Child, Fire, by a Hungarian theater group displayed violence and nudity that didn't go down well with the local audience. For the opposition, the festivals presided over by the Empress herself epitomized the worst effects of the Shah's regime. Despite his conservative and often regressive style of rule, Mohammad Reza Shah projected the image of a revolutionary monarch at the vanguard of social change. Timoka and the festivals, along with other mega projects, were part of a global third way. In the Russian case, the steady decline of the House of Romanov had opened up a public space between the revolutions in 1905 and 1917 for the Russian avant-garde to come to fruition. In Iran, the Pahlavi dynasty fell abruptly. The centralization of power in the hands of a few throughout the 70s left room for neither an ideological nor a public space for the maturation of the Iranian avant-garde that would instigate, or at the very least, represent political revolt. The elite's wholehearted embrace of the avant-garde joined its fate to that of the dynasty. When the revolutionary momentum began, the avant-garde, with a few sporadic exceptions in poster design, was unable to muster a descending philosophy and aesthetic of its own. Nor did Farah's commitment to contemporary art help the revolutionary intentions of individual artists. In 1979, when the intelligentsia, the students, and the clerics rose against the monarchy, the avant-garde's time had lapsed. Well-known artists followed the royal family into exile. Seamlessly the seamless to the world, Iranian avant-garde entered a state of global flux while at home, social realism took over the street. Art students and amateur artists rapidly filled the gap left by accomplished artists. In line with Foucault's short-sighted praise of Iran's spiritual yet modern revolution, the amateur uh, artists began to synthesize classical revolutionary styles from Mexico, Russia, Cuba, and China with Islamic iconography. Eight years of brutal war with Iraq further reinforced the official status of this popular art. In the 1990s, however, things began to change. The war had ended and Imam Khomeini had died. The invasive state propaganda art led to the development of street art, graffiti art, and underground medias, and in some cases, even before, um, it, these things became very uh, accepted and popular in, in the West. Visual artist uh, A101 was one of its first practitioners at age 11. Many followed him into the streets where the ideological battle are fought in graphics. So you have, he's basically the Banksy, or um, so we have Banksy and uh, A11 um, uh, sort of doing these 
uh, inter-art historical uh, jokes and undermining issues of the frame. Uh, and of course, Mona Lisa was not behaving, um, and, um, and all of this is happening in the street. In a post-war reconstruction effort, President Rafsanjani foregrounded the notion of beauty, during which many art schools and academic were launched. President Khatami's landslide election in 1997 pushed further and placed beautification at the center of civil society reform. He appointed liberal-minded officials in important posts who in turn brought Timoka back and uh, instituted liberal artistic policies with long efforts, uh, long-term efforts. And this is a, um, a sort of a little poster that I photographed uh, right before the election, presidential election, uh, the, the eve of the presidential election in 2009. And, um, uh, the boyfriend was very um, cautious and he's like, just photograph uh, the, the image, not m my girlfriend's face, uh, which I did. So I want you to notice, uh, so it's a play on, of course, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. Uh, again, a reference to uh, and co-option of uh, uh, sort of Western art historical imagery. Uh, but very cleverly, uh, you have the modern uh, institution of voting and the fingerprint, uh, sort of the ink fingerprint, and of course the uh, color-coded uh, um, uh, green color of Musavi. And I love the contrast between the, um, the fingerprint that is inked and the perfectly French manicured nails. <laughs> and this also taps into uh, larger global uh, um, culture of uh, popular uh, visual narratives. Rafsanjani's uh, economic shift to an open market system and Khatami's ushering of cultural dialogue uh, further prepared the ground for the reintroduction of Western art market into, or rather, around Iran. There seems to be a general misconception that international interest in contemporary Middle Eastern art began with the opening of Western auction houses in the Persian states. Repeatedly, artists, gallery owners, and collectors insisted that the opening in 2005 of Christie's International in Dubai suddenly started, quote unquote, the whole thing. Sotheby's, which had negotiated the most difficult purchases for Timoka back in the 70s, opened a branch in Doha in 2009. Today, well-funded art institutions, including the Louvre, Guggenheim, Art Dubai, Art Paris and Christie's International hire star architects to house and promote contemporary Iranian, Arab, Turkish, and Indian art out of Persian Gulf. And one of them, of course, is Zahadi, who passed away about uh, 10 days ago. Since 2005, many Iranian artists have found in Dubai, Doha, and Kuwait City a meeting place of dialogue and display. These artworks often reflect the in-between position between geopolitics, market categories, and fractured identities. Artists come, come from everywhere. LA-based Fallah's painting, <coughs> Pump You Up, displays a series of brick and brack on multiple shelves dominated by cutouts of Arnold Schwarzenegger. In Louis Vuitton, the New York-based artist Jinji takes form out of context, creating a mode of abstraction that straddles Western com commercial and Iranian illustrated traditions. Along same lines, the Tehran-based photographer Ali Abadi depicts a teenager in her photograph, Miss Hybrid. The sexualized girl holds a popsicle to her li red lips while talking on the phone. Her nose job, her um, barely veiled fake blonde hair, and her consumer trappings speak to the globalization of capital and negate Western media's depiction of the Middle East. When asked, the Tehran gallery director, Noe Bashari, corrected me. It's not a Southern interest, but a delayed one. Our artists were ready 
but no one knew what was going on behind closed doors. Everyone only saw mullahs and calligraphies. Conceptual artists Sehi and Jamali noted that when Dubai was not in the scene, contacts existed with Eastern Europe and East Asia with productive results. New York-based Azari reverses the formula by arguing that the explosion of world interest in Iranian art occurred because of the expansion in Iran and not the Gulf states of higher education in the arts. This was combined with the metropolization, metropolization of Islamic Republic, where according to Azari, artistic activities remained, quote, a little corner for free expression. His own work interrogates constructs of gender and kitsch. With strong graphic tools and deployment of popular Shia narratives, he points to the commercialization of religion in late capitalism. What the Gulf states did for the globalization of art was to bring the art market to the doorstep of Iran, as well as India and the Arab world where the new avant-garde movement was in full swing. That art has always been global speaks to our own art historical blind spot. The market does not care what it sells, only if, the, it, if it does or not. According to Christie's statistics, 65% of buyers are locals. 30% of the sales are of contemporary art. Head of the Society of Iranian Painters, Mozaffari, remarked that the Christie's auction is, quote, first and, first and foremost, a bazaar, where the most important criteria of judgment is not aesthetics, unquote. The auction, uh, uh, that the auctions have created a popular taste that lends itself to calligraphic painting. A Tehran art critic wrote, quote, the market has created a false trend forcing artists to produce works with exotic Middle Eastern feel. Another said in private, all Farah Moshiri and Shiri Neshat are doing is to sell souvenirs. In protest, Golshiri and Hassan, Hassan Zadeh have simply refused to sell their work in the Gulf market. They condemned the, quote, tyrannical sheikhdoms and their accomplices, the Western auction houses. These artists take issue with affluent patrons who buy art not for its aesthetic value, but rather for financial gains. The New York-based painter uh, Aram has publicly condemned Sotheby's packaging of artists as yet another colonial strategy to dominate the economy and the Orient. By classifying and celebrating all artists with at least one Iranian-born parent under the rubric of contemporary Iranian, he believes auction houses perpetuate the desire to create a mythology of the East as other. Only one thing matters, he writes, the marketable identity of the artist. Others fear that the globalization of Iranian art will deprive it of its most calligraphic, uh, um, co compelling quality, its political potency. That is a departure from the Pahlavi art that was characterized by its critiques as politically non-committed. They are afraid that corporate capitalism will swallow the grassroots into its bottomless belly of greed. Confronted by the pressures of globalization, artists remarked, that art for art's sake, art sake is dead after 9-11. According to the Tehran-based painter, <coughs> Zanjani, it is the bazaar that demands political art. It was 9-11, said Taraboli, that changed the market and the world. In the Iranian context, the market has done more than that. Quote, by becoming an arbitrator, the market has replaced the filter of critics and curators cautions us the former MoMA curator, Fereshte Daftari, adding that while this encourages artists to take up an artistic career, it leads to a cultural dilatonism that says anything goes if it's sellable, Unquote. 
true, many artists produce to cater to buyers. It is also true that the Iranian art community has a long and self-aware history of its own avant-garde. And I think that this is very important. It's not something that happened yesterday. Um, and it's actually very local. The analysis of contemporary Iranian art is by no means about the market. It can be shown that the majority of artists are motivated not by the market, but by the intellectual, political, and artistic momentum and priorities of their own. For Farhad Moshiri, whose work Love sold at Dubai's Christie's in 2008, for above the one million dollar mark, the run of the, that market into that history is a fortunate coincidence. Esh played on the Western stereotype of Persian calligraphy, love poetry, and archeological objects. Addressing the politics of archeology, span Ai Weiwei famously performed the destruction of such a work. I kill the thing you love. I kill the thing you love. Our valorization is the cause of their destruction. Moshiri's heightened sense of icon commodification goes back to his student days at the fine arts department at Cal Arts during the Reagan era. Like the Puerto Rican artist Osorio, Moshiri deploys kitsch and glitz to point to the problematic packaging of race, class, and beauty. In effect, the glamorization of taste. They both call into question what is contemporary, what is traditional, what is Puerto Rican, what is Iranian, no matter. Moshidi calls this fusion as embedded cynicism. In 2008, Christie's sold Tanaboli's bronze sculpture, The Wall, for $2.85 million. Dubbed the most expensive Iranian cultural heritage, many felt that that is its real price belatedly appreciated. The Western art market has thus opened up a space, a space of representation for artists to critique Western aesthetic and ethical standards. The engagement with the Western canon undermines its validity. Murtazavi draws classical nudes as all artists do everywhere. But since he cannot display them, he cuts them into pieces and glues them into a cube. He thus reinvents the boxing of naked women in the museum. While the, while the 1960s generation of artists stayed locked in a dysfunctional relationship with the West, as Daftari notes, the generation now plays on long-standing conventions in order to question the structures that inform them. In her digital mixed media, four minutes, 30 seconds to recover Le Temps Perdu, La Chaille projected moving images on a painted canvas. Here, the three figures of Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe are visually cut and pasted onto Persian calligraphic surfaces. The figures gradually morph into three contemporary figures, with boots, jeans, t-shirts, and Ray-Ban sunglasses. Manet's nude gets casually wrapped in a cloth. The temporal experience of the work is juxtaposed with the slow transition from imp imp um, Impressionism to contemporary periods. A mere four and a half minutes to recover something lost. A homeliness, a stable identity, a whole civilization. Four and a half minutes. With his sculpture, a cliche for mass media, the Tehran-based artist Labouti engages Duchamp's fountain with a critical fondness for commercialism. He presents us with an upright toilet bowl of a type commonly used in various parts of Asia. On it, we read in Persian letters, I am free, you are free, they are free. Black letters are imprinted on a white, shiny surface. The gesture is as striking as Duchamp's fountain when it first appeared in 1917. 
these engagements are not only cross-cultural, but interdisciplinary within art history. They are commentaries in the abstraction and absurdity of avant-garde's own history. These artists represent the hybridized, fragmented self that can be regenerated in exile. They denote the liberating potentials of liminality, but also the anxiety of global displacement. Curator Till Feldrat of Chelsea Museum wrote in 2009, ironically, the artists living abroad often draw more on their cultural heritage, while those inside focus more on issues of everyday life without regards to Iranian references. There is no irony here. Juxtaposition discloses the diasporic anxiety of nostalgia, of identity, and of longing for a return home. While at home, concerns about self-expression, of rights, and of livelihood are foregrounded instead. The diversity of style, technique, subject matter, and artistic thinking further reveals the difficulty of the unproblematized uh, rubric of contemporary Iranian art. This was evident during the Iran Inside Out exhibition at the Chelsea Museum. With the exception of at least one Iranian parent, um, nothing united the particip participants under the umbrella of Iranian per se. Frame, uh, famed art critic Karim Emomi's 18, 1986 question, what is Iranian in their work, anticipates the awkward answer of nothing much. During MoMA's exhibition, Without, uh, Without Boundary, 17 Ways of Looking, Homi Baba posed and answered this same question. Iranian or not, that is not the question. When asked, Zanjani said, since I am Iranian, my art is Iranian, even though his figures struggle to find a balanced self on slippery oil pipelines. And of course, this is a reference to if, if Mossad there hadn't fall, if uh, sort of it's that kind of. With a similar firmness, Tirafkan wrote, the roots of my art are Iranian based because I am an Iranian. Another Tehran based painter, uh, Hamze nullified my question by simply saying, I don't believe in that crap. Most of his large paintings uh, of portraits of friends and family depict the endlessly fractured, distorted self. So here you're looking at um, um, the artist in the middle who has painted um, uh, Mortazavi, you're seeing the painting there, of Mortazavi who's helping him to move the, so you have an artist, you have another artist, the artist of the cube, um, and, and their friends, and the artwork of um, the model here. Surely those who stand on the homeland are often careless of the exilic experience, of the pain of hovering between lands and languages, while those outside can but vaguely imagine the uh, strategies of survival as an artist in a censored environment. Tehran-based Darebari pointed to the Western art market's double standard of cynicism and orientalism. Quote, I got rejected then only because I was Iranian. I am accepted now only because I am Iranian. The global orientalist operation on the definition of contemporary Iranian art is revealed by the London-based curator Issa's account of a conversation with her own artist. Quote, how surprised she was to arrive in Germany as Parastovuru had and then gradually to become the Iranian artist Parastu Faruhar. During my own interview, the LA-based painter Kohan noted a number of times that he wanted to become an Iranian artist. The conception of an elsewhere, regardless of where one stands, whether one stands on it 
or longs for it from afar, remains central to the making of Iranian art today. At times, it is a form of fetish or a point of the origin of the construction of uh, that fetish. Iran lives inside me. I create and recreate it through my work, said the once San Francisco, now London-based Afsun. Iran is what I lost. For diasporic artists, the notion of home is often entangled with that of the return. The act of return is loaded with one's exilic certainty. Both Shirin Neshat and Waisi Kami suddenly realized that they were, they had been in exile after a return to Iran during Khatami's open door policy period. That was their phone call, and I bet you they were also in their pajamas at least conceptually. In historiography, the return returns. Curators and critics underscore in their writings that so, such and such artist still lives and works in Tehran, as if the natural development of global art lends itself to the West, as if contemporary art is governed by a te teleological impulse, a teleology of temporal and spatial linearity that culminates in exile. Living and painting in Tehran, in Baghdad, in Bombay, and Beijing become a conditionality. The hyphenated identities of young artists complicate the global nature of contemporary art. I haven't tried to be an Iranian artist, insisted the LA-based painter Falwell, but rather an artist who happens to have some local influence and descent. What he said points to the idea that everyone comes from somewhere, and if all wares were the same. I want to be myself, said the Brookline-based illustrator uh, Rahmanian, whose English translation of Ferdosi Shahnameh was recently um, released. I don't want to be categorized, and I never want to sell my art as Iranian. He and others explained that the notion of Iran is so politicized in the Western psyche and media that when artists sell their work as Iranian, they help reinforce that stereotype. Falwell continued, calligraphy or the veil appeal to some sort of exoticism. If anything, they reinforce stereotypes. For veteran artists, such as the Brookline-based political painter, Nojumi, who was banned from Iran both by king and imam, things look clearer for some reason. It does not matter to be away from Iran. My painting is American art from an Iranian lens. I work in the language of painting. Most of those that I engage, regardless of their successful and continuous effort to transcend national, linguistic, ethnic, and exilic boundaries, have a tie of some sort which can be reinvented, reimagined as a home. Carabello Farman called it a visual baggage that finds its way into our work. Murtazavi called it my boxes of inspiration. Why be truncated by, by what Salman Rushdie called a whole sight, when the privilege of a kind of double perspective might hold? As both insiders and outsiders, these artists of, uh, offer a stereoscopic vision that demonstrates Homi Baba's point, that it is by living on the borderline of history and language, on the limits of race and gender, that we are in a position to translate the differences between them into a kind of solidarity. Iranians talk about their history in terms of befores and afters, remarked Carabello of the Argentinian half of the duo of Carabello Farman. In their street art regarding the horror, individual faces in moments of suffering were plastered on billboards in Los Angeles. Then these faces were transferred onto plates at the 2009 Havana Biennale. The work conceals the pain that it depicts. Exilic anguish is revealed in the facial expressions. 
whose grief is produced and reproduced as if factory made, from the billboard to lovely plates. The pristine arrangement of these plates on a white mantle above a homely fireplace conveys the agony of the desire to belong. Carabello Farman do not mean to criticize each of their <coughs> immigrant communities. They instead, instead want to gain something in translation. In their work, as well as in the way they, have, they had turned into um, one artist, one person, they echo Rushdie's notion of translated man. It is normally support, supposed that something always gets lost in translation. Rushdie clings to the notion that something can also be gained. We are trying to be truthful to our work, explained the once LA and now Tehran based Murtazabi. It might be exotic, it might be modern, we don't pick and choose based on what the West wants. Today, young artists belong to a global history of art where the peripheries come to alter uh, the epistemic centers. Daftari uh, asks whether, quote, this is a phenomenon of greater tolerance of, or diversity or only the cloak of increased homogenization. By coming to terms with capitalism and colonialism, artists in the global art market have rendered the canonical judgment of aesthetics at once null and void and hybrid and universal. As the visual theorist Mirzoyev put it, global capital simply treats the West with the same indifference that it once reserved for its others. The big one, perched next to the king, looks a lot like you. I said to the once London-based artist at Bussy. Well, yes, it is me, she said. So what about the other, the other birds, I asked. Well, they're waiting to be released from something, she answered as if obvious. What are they waiting for, I wondered. Oh, you know, it's really a state of being, she explained. Are they perhaps waiting to go home? Oh my god, of course, she replied while lifting her head away from a suffocating figurine in her New York studio. Addressing the fantasy of return, the London-based photographer Tabrizian tackles the anxiety of the perpetual deferral of something that might never come not necessarily a return to the homeland, but the return of the homeland. Her photograph, The Long Wait, depicts a woman on an armchair, or an empty room, a small suitcase, a closed door. She gazes nowhere. Palestinian artist Sadeh's Deployment of the suitcase is similarly juxtaposed to the concrete block that prevents her from either staying or leaving. She just waits. Tabrizian notes that her work uses a notion of waiting akin to that of Beckett's waiting for Godot. Metaphorically to include the underlying reality that migration is a one-way trip. The missing doorknob is a powerful signifier of the dubious return. Whereas her photograph, Tehran 06, depicts a similar state of isolation and lingering that occurs not in exile, but within the national borders of the motherland. Blur blurring the margins of home and host, this sense of lingering denotes a state of waiting for something, perhaps a desired reform the veracity of which is as dubious as the homecoming. Abbasi's plea, for God's sake, make a commitment to being here, points to Tabrizian's missing doorknob. The most iconic returnee from exile is surely Amal his arrival at Tehran's Mehrabad airport on 1st of February 1979 marks the moment that ruptures the before from the after. 
As the exile, the imam's return generated the largest Iranian diaspora in its long history. The collective and personal stories of which revolve around the often imagined moment of return. His homecoming famously captured in numerous photographs, films, and artworks ties and splits the global and the local identities into a holistic but fractured history. The New York-based artist Avinia's collage of Imam Khomeini's slow descend, descending Air, Air France depicts that exact moment of before, after, in the modality of visual replication. The exilic psyche constantly relives the return home as if on repeat. A digital echo loop that mirrors its disturbing pathology. With Farhad Yan's painting, Mehrabad, we end with the same moment with which a narrative on contemporaneity began. February, <coughs> Tehran's International Airport. The exile's transitory state now translates into a spatial absurdity of inhabiting a no place, a no land. Farhad Yan's faceless figures stand on the airplane's staircase. Suitcase in hand, waiting, just waiting. Their nostalgic melancholia now turns into a jittering apprehension. The exiled are suspended somewhere between here and there, between native soil and an unknown elsewhere. Neither on the motherland nor, nor the other land, they, like Vladimir and Estragon, wait for something that will never come. With characteristic thoughtfulness, the young painter explained to me. Mehrabad, Tehran's old airport, has seen the coming and going of many important individuals. It has also seen many ordinary people forever leave their homeland and never return. At their feet lies a lion's skin. The lion, which in Iranian culture signifies power and courage, roars at the onlooker. But of its remains an outer skin and an aggressive face. A paradox is revealed by the tension between the image and the word, Mehrabad, a prosperous land of love, kindness, and hospitality. Thank you.